My name is Dr. Chikuma Anidike. Today's lecture is going to be metabolism in the human body. This is how the lecture is going to be structured. We're going to start by defining metabolism. And not only are we going to define metabolism, we're going to define metabolism in a concise and precise way. We're also gonna talk about the building blocks involved in metabolism, monomers and polymers. And the reason that I'm going to do this first is, is because I think about the building blocks as, a, as the language to describe metabolism. Yeah, you know, you have to know the words before you can put them together in a sentence. We're going to talk about catabolic reactions we're also going to talk about anabolic reactions. And at the end, we're going to put this all together and illustrate how it works in the human body, starting with food intake and digestion. What is metabolism? It is more than just important for weight loss because typically when we think about Metabolism, when we hear the word metabolism, we automatically think about, about a weight loss program. But it's more than just weight loss. According to a Google search using the keyword metabolism, it is defined as the chemical processes that occur within a living organism in order to maintain life. This is a very accurate and concise definition which encompasses every chemical reaction that occurs in the human body. I mean, think about it, it's very simple. Metabolism is all the chemical processes that occur in your body in order to keep you alive. When it comes to metabolism, the number of chemical reactions and their complexity is mind boggling. I will not describe every chemical reaction that occurs in the human body. Time would stop before I could even finish. However, I will try to simplify it by focusing on some of the most important metabolic processes. There are two main categories of metabolic reactions. There are catabolic reactions in which molecules are broken down in order to release energy. There are anabolic reactions in which energy is used to construct complex macromolecules. Now it's time for us to understand the building blocks. And the building blocks are, are, are monomers and the, and the complex molecules are the polymers. There are four main categories listed here. For example, you have your carbohydrate, which is the polymer, and you have the monomer, which is a monosaccharide such as glucose, which makes up the carbohydrate. You also have lipids such as triglycerides, which are the polymer. The corresponding monomer are the fatty acids. You have nucleic acids such as DNA and RNA, which are made up of nucleotides, which are the monomers. You have many proteins in your body, which are made up of amino acids, which again are the monomers. So in general, monomers come together to create polymers. So for carbohydrates, the monomer is glucose. And as you can see here, glucose is a six carbon organic molecule. And many of these glucose molecules come together to, to create glycogen, which is a complex polysaccharide. Now let's look at fatty acids and lipids. The monomer in this case is a fatty acids, which, is a, which consists of a long hydrocarbon chain and a carboxylic acid group. And this this hydrocarbon chain can have any number of carbons. It can be a short 
chain, it can be a long chain. But the point is that three of these chains are combined with glycerol in order to form a triglyceride. Next, we have nucleotides and nucleic acids. The monomer are nucleotides. And as you can see, as you can see, there are five different types of nucleotides. Three of these belong to the pyrimidine group, and two of these belong to the purine group. But the point is, is that you have these nucleotides which come together and they form nucleic acids, such as DNA, which contains our genetic code, and RNA, which one of its functions is to code for protein. We also have amino acids and proteins. We have, we have 20 different amino acids, and these 20 different amino acids can combine in all sorts of permutations in order to produce proteins. And these, and these proteins vary widely in size and in shape, and in function as well. Now that we've finished describing the building blocks, let's talk about what a catabolic reaction is. So in catabolic reactions, macromolecules are broken down into smaller molecules in order to release energy. And this energy is typically converted to adenosine triphosphate, or ATP for short. ATP is the currency for energy. It's like how the US dollar is the currency for money. ATP is the currency for energy, and it's used to power all bodily functions. And as, I, and as you can see from this, this picture, you have, um, you have this molecule which is broken down into smaller molecules, and energy is released as a byproduct of this reaction. Now I'm just going to take an aside to talk about adenosine triphosphate, which, as I already mentioned, is the energy currency of the body. And the reason that it's the energy currency of the body is because of its high energy phosphate bond. And, and when this high energy phosphate bond is broken, energy is released and adenosine triphosphate is converted to adenosine diphosphate, or ADP for short. So like I just said, ATP carries energy in its high energy phosphate bond. Examples of catabolic reactions include glycogen breakdown, which is also known as glycogen, glycogenolysis, and glycogen is broken down into glucose molecules. It also consists of glucose breakdown to produce energy, also known as glycolysis, protein breakdown into amino acids, or proteolysis, and triglyceride breakdown into fatty acids, or lipolysis, and nucleic acid breakdown into nucleotides. Let's talk about glycogenolysis in a little more detail. As you can see in this picture, the glycogen is broken down into many glucose molecules. This process involves a variety of enzymatic reactions. And this, this glucose can itself be used as energy, or it can be reassembled later on to form more glycogen. And speaking of glucose being used for energy, let's talk about the process of glycolysis. So in glycolysis, glucose is broken down to generate energy in the form of ATP. So from, the, from glycolysis, you, get, you have your glucose, and you get two ATP, and you, and you get two pyruvate. This pyruvate can also go through the citric acid cycle to generate even more ATP. So between glycolysis and the citric acid cycle, up to 38 ATP 
can be generated from a single molecule of glucose. The actual number ranges from 30 to 38, so 38 is the maximum number. Now let's talk about proteolysis, which is the breakdown of protein. So proteins are broken down into amino acids. And again, this involves a variety of enzymatic reactions. And these amino acids that are yielded from protein can be used either, either as fuel or as, or as building blocks for new proteins. And this picture here nicely demonstrates although in a pretty oversimplified fashion, how proteins are eventually broken down into amino acids. Now we're gonna talk about the breakdown of fat, or in this case, the breakdown of triglycerides or lipolysis. So triglycerides are broken down into, into fatty acids and glycerol. This again involves enzymatic breakdown. And in this case, in this case, you have your molecule of triglycerides being broken down into one molecule of glycerol and three molecules of fatty acids. These fatty acids can be used as fuel or they can be reassembled as triglycerides. And as a matter of fact, between fat, protein, and carbohydrates, fat, also, fat actually stores the most energy per gram. It stores nine kilocalories per gram of fat whereas protein stores seven kilocalories per gram and, uh, and carbohydrate for, stores four, kilogram, four kilocalories per gram. Now let's talk about the breakdown of nucleic acids. So nucleic acids such as DNA and RNA can be broken down by nucleases into nucleotides. And as I just mentioned, it involves enzymatic breakdown with nucleases. And these nucleotides can be reassembled to form nucleic acids later on. Now that we've talked about catabolism, let's shift our focus to talking about anabolic reactions. First of all, let's define what it is. Anabolic reactions mean that smaller molecules are used to create bigger molecules called macromolecules, and energy is required for this process. And this energy typically comes from ATP. Examples of anabolic reactions include protein synthesis, gly glycogen synthesis, also known as glycog glycogenesis, also involves lipogenesis, which is triglyceride synthesis, so you're making fat, and nucleic acid synthesis. Let's talk about protein synthesis. So this diagram nicely demonstrates how, how amino acids are combined in order to make proteins. And if you think about it, it's an exact reverse of the of protein breakdown. So you have your amino acids, they're used to produce peptides which eventually form polypeptides which we commonly call protein. Energy is, energy is required for this process. And these proteins that are created can be used to form the structural elements of the cells such as, such as the cytoskeleton it can form structural elements of tissues such as myofibrils in muscle. It also forms structural elements in organs, or this protein can be broken down into amino acids, which themselves could be used as an energy source or reassembled to form more protein. Now let's talk about glycogenesis. Glycogen is formed from the polymerization of multiple glucose molecules. So what I just said is that all you're doing is getting a bunch of glucose molecules, putting them together, and making 
and making glycogen out of it. Energy is used since it's an anabolic reaction. And this glycogen is used to store energy, especially in the liver and in skeletal muscle. Or it can be broken down to form more molecules of glucose. Let's talk about lipogenesis. So lipogenesis, you have triglycerides, which are made by combining glycerol and three fatty acid chains. Again, like most anabolic reactions, energy is consumed. And these triglycerides are, are used to store energy in our body in the form of, in the form of fat in adipose tissue or it can be broken, or they can be broken back down into fatty acids, which in turn can be used to generate energy. Another anabolic reaction is nucleic acid synthesis. So nucleic acids such as DNA and RNA are made from, made from nucleotides, and this takes place on a cellular level. Energy is required for these processes. And nucleic acids such as DNA are used, to, are used to form our genetic code. And nucleic acids such as RNA code for proteins. Now that we've talked about catabolic reactions and anabolic reactions, let's put it together. And I'm going to use a favorite example of mine. So on a Saturday, I woke up, I went to the gym worked out really hard, burned a lot of calories. Since it's a Saturday, I've designated it as my cheat day. I went to Popeye's and bought a four piece fried chicken combo and ate it. I was thinking about an eight piece, but it was too big. I really enjoyed it. And I bet you're wondering, what does Popeye's chicken have to do with metabolism? You're about to find out. So let's look at the macronutrient composition of this fatty cheat meal that I just ate. So you have your fats, which come from the chicken and the french fries. You have protein, which comes from the chicken. And you have carbohydrates, which come from the bread and around the chicken and the french fries. Probably not from the soda I drank since I drank a Diet Coke. But that's not the point. However, once all this tasty food enters my digestive system, the above listed molecules that I just talked about will be digested. So let's talk about the carbohydrate digestion. So the carbohydrates that enter my digestive system are broken down into monomers in the small intestine by enzymes such as amylase, which are made in the pancreas, as well as enzymes on the intestinal brush border, which means there are enzymes in the wall of the small intestine that help break down carbohydrates. And, and, car and these monomers, including glucose, are absorbed through the intestine and enter the bloodstream. So essentially what I just said is that that starch is broken down into, into glucose and the glucose is absorbed. And this, and this picture kind of demonstrates that. Now the fat that I just consumed from this meal enters my digestive system and the bile acids that are made in the liver fun function as a detergent to break up the fat into smaller droplets in order to increase its surface area and make it easier to digest. So fats such as triglycerides are broken into fatty acids by pancreatic lipase. And once the triglycerides enter the intestinal wall, they are once the fatty acids enter the, enter the intestinal wall, they're reconstituted into triglycerides and they combine with other molecules such as cholesterol and proteins to form collomicrons, which are absorbed into the bloodstream. So essentially what I just said is that, is that fat is digested, the triglycerides are broken down into fatty acids, only to be reconstituted in the wall of the intestine and absorbed as a, 
as a complex molecule into the bloodstream. The protein is also digested, and the protein is broken down sequentially by enzymes in the stomach and the small intestine into amino, into amino acids. Most digestion takes place in the small intestine by various enzymes. And once the protein is completely broken down into amino acids, these amino acids are then absorbed into the bloodstream. So now, the macronutrients such as the protein, the fats, and the carbohydrates have been digested. The monomers have been absorbed. So what happens? How will the glucose molecules be handled? What are we gonna do with all those amino acids? And what about the triglyceride and the chylomicrons? What happens next? Let's go through this. So, so you got your glucose in the bloodstream. So the glucose in the bloodstream is transported into the is transported to the liver and the skeletal muscle, and and the glucose is used to create glycogen by gly, glycogenesis. So as you can so as you can kind of see here, you have polymerization of glucose molecules into into glycogen. And glycogen is actually a complex branched, branched structure consisting of multiple glucose molecules. So, so essentially here, glucose is, is converted into glycogen and stored as energy in your muscles and in your liver. And then, and then whenever, whenever you need energy, like say you're gonna say you're gonna work out, the glycogen is in the, the glycogen in the muscle is broken down into glucose, and the glucose in turn is broken down into ATP, which powers muscle contractions. <coughs> the glycogen that's stored in the liver is also broken down into glucose, and this glucose is delivered into the bloodstream in order to elevate your your blood glucose levels. And, the, and serum glucose is taken up by tissues such as the brain, which exclusively use glucose as a fuel source. And this glucose generates ATP, which powers processes in the brain, such as nerve conduction. The amino acids that have been absorbed in the bloodstream are used to create protein and your, your RNA is used to code for these proteins. And these proteins that are made come in different shapes and sizes, and they perform a multitude of functions, including forming the structural elements of the cells and tissues, and even functioning as ion channels and enzymes. And, and these proteins that are made from amino acids can actually be broken down, especially in, star in starvation states. And when this happens, proteins are broken down into amino acids, and some of these amino acids can be converted to glucose, which supply tissues like the brain and red blood cells, which exclusively use glucose as a fuel source. And some of these proteins can also be converted into energy in other ways as well. And now let's talk about fat metabolism. So the triglycerides that are being carried in a bloodstream are, di are deposited into, into adipocytes, which are the fat cells. So essentially, the fat flowing around in the bloodstream is deposited into your fat cells in order to store energy. And these triglycerides that are, that are stored in the fat cells can, be, can serve as a fuel source and can be broken down into glycerol and fatty acids. And these fatty acids undergo beta ox oxidation, which generates acetyl-CoA, which in turn generates ATP. So essentially, fatty acids are essentially what happens to fatty acids through beta oxygen oxidation is that they're broken down two carbons at a time, releasing energy in the process until the fat is completely broken down. Thank <laughs> you.
So we've talked about the major metabolic processes that occur after, after eating and digestion. So let's, let's try to put it together some more. And as you can see, overall metabolism, it's a complex and dynamic process. And the chemical reactions that I've discussed are by no means all-inclusive. And catabolic and anabolic reactions tend to exist in an equilibrium, where in general, the synthetic reactions occur at almost the same rate as, as destructive reactions or catabolic reactions. So anabolism and catabolism tend to balance each other out. So we just went over this. So you have your, you eat some food, your macronutrients such as your fat, carbohydrates, and proteins are, are broken down into their constituent monomers. So you have your glycerol and your free fatty acids. You have your fatty acid pool, and your fatty acids can be can be can be used to generate energy. They can be they can be stored as fat as well. You have your carbohydrates, which are broken down into glucose, <coughs> and your glucose can be your glucose can be used used to generate energy in order to fuel in order to fuel brain activity as well as tissue activity any excess glucose can be converted to fat or they can be stored as as glycogen in the brain no not in the brain but in the muscle and in the liver the amino acids from protein can be used to in synthetic reactions to produce more protein in the body with a multitude of functions or they can actually be undergo gluconeogenesis where they're converted to glucose and can be used as an energy source. And this is just another diagram illustrating metabolism, which, which reiterates a lot of the points that I just, that I just went over. But I think the, this picture is a little is descriptive in its own way. But since, since we're running out of time, I'm not going to go into gr any great detail describing this picture since I've already talked about a lot of the points I'm going to, that I was going to make in the previous slide. So in summary, what are the take-home messages? Metabolism consists of all chemical reactions that occur in the human body to maintain life. It can be divided into catabolic reactions and anabolic reactions. ATP is the energy currency of the body. Catabolic reactions involve the breakdown of complex organic molecules, such as polymers, into simple molecules, the monomers, to produce energy in the form of ATP. Anabolic reactions involve the synthesis of complex organic molecules, the polymers, from simple molecules such as monomers with the consumption of energy. Catabolic and anabolic reactions exist in an equilibrium. The major catabolic reactions discussed are glycogenolysis, which is the breakdown of glycogen into glucose, glycolysis, which is the breakdown of glucose to form ATP, proteolysis, which is the breakdown of protein into amino acids, and lipolysis, which is the breakdown of triglycerides into fatty acids and glycerol. The major anabolic reactions consist of glyco glycogenesis, which is the formation of glycogen from individual glucose molecules, protein synthesis from amino acids, lipogenesis, which is the formation of triglycerides from fatty acids and glycerol, and catabolic And as I already mentioned, catabolic and anabolic reactions do exist in an equilibrium. Thank you very much for taking your time to listen. I hope that you have learned something from this lecture.